So uh, we're talking about freedom. And one of the, why the camera's here? <laughs> I don't know, it's close. Uh, one of the amazing things about a concept like freedom is that no matter what audience I go to anywhere in the world, right? No matter where it is, who they are, uh, and ask people, are you guys for freedom? Like, are you guys for freedom? Anybody here against freedom? No. And if you were all communists and asked the same question, what do you think the response would be? Everybody was for freedom. I mean, freedom is one of these concepts we throw around out there. We don't define, but and everybody's for it. Nobody's ever against freedom, explicit. Nobody ever said, yeah, I want to say freedom. Some of them do want to say that I'm for it. Oh, I want to be a slave. Almost everybody, everybody out there, is for some conception of freedom. And part of the challenge we have when it comes to freedom is that we're not always talking the same language. We're not using the terminology the same. When you talk to a bunch of communists, let's say, or fascists, doesn't really matter, uh, I know Nikos talked about the right today, so uh, the, the same thing. When you ask them if they're for freedom, they say yes, but then you ask them what freedom is, it turns out to be something completely different than I think what most of us have in our mind. So, uh, you know, it's really, really important, generally in life, it's really, really important when we're talking about ideas, it's really, really important when we're talking about, uh, you know, how to... How to change your culture, or how to, how to even change your own life, and, and, and change things about your own life, to be very clear about what kind of, what the concept you're using, what the words you're using mean. And freedom is one of those things that everybody talks about, and nobody defines. Nobody defines. You just, and, and you don't know when somebody's saying, I'm for freedom, you don't know what they're talking about, because everybody's for freedom. So, really, really important to first understand what freedom means, and then we can talk about why it's important. But before we can talk about why it's important, we need to know what does the concept mean. So, what, what, what does freedom mean? The ability to do whatever you want. The ability to do whatever you want. So, I want to fly. What are the... So whatever's metaphysically possible and you want, so I, you know, I, I really feel like slapping you right now in the face without hurting anybody. <laughs> yes. Anybody else? What 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 does freedom mean? Yeah. There's no such thing as absolute freedom. What's absolute freedom? Because I think there is such a thing as absolute freedom. Uh, it has to be absolute, otherwise there's nothing other. But like how would you define absolute freedom? You can't fly. You know, if, if it was absolute freedom, then you could. Well, if we define freedom as doing whatever the hell you wanted, then there's no such thing as absolute freedom. But it strikes me as you can't define a term in a way that makes applying it impossible unless you're talking about fantasy. But we're talking about a real term in real life. I think it should have a definition that is doable. And notice that the definition of I can't fly assumes that freedom is, you know, some kind of subjective, whatever I feel like, you know, and, and is that what we mean by freedom? Is freedom the ability to do whatever you feel like doing, irrespective of human nature, irrespective of whether you hurt other people, irrespective of whether it's even possible? I don't think so concept like freedom to have meaning, particularly if you're going to fight for it, if you're going to actually go out there and engage with people and, and try to convince them freedom is a good thing, it better be real, it better be something that's achievable, it better not be something that's a fantasy. And I think one of the real problems in the world out there is that people define it exactly that way, that there's no such thing as absolute freedom, I can't fly after all, I can't, I can't reverse the law of the physics, shit, right, isn't that awful? And, and that's how the left, predominant, defines freedom. Right? You know, freedom is 
doing whatever the hell you feel like doing. It's impossible. So we have to have some limits of freedom. So now it's to meet the limits of freedom. There's not going to be freedom anymore. We're not going to meet the limits of freedom. But the real question is, no, I, I, I want to be free, but that concept has to mean something to me. And, and when I say I want to be free, I, I don't mean I want to be free from the laws of physics. And I don't think that's a meaningful term. What does it even mean to be free from the laws of physics? That would be like, you know, it, it, it would be a contradiction. It, it just doesn't, doesn't add up to anything. So the concept loses all meaning. So somebody else wanted to say something. Yeah, in the back. What's that? To never live for the sake of others, you know, have that live for yourself. So to never live for the sake of others, to never live uh, and never and never have them to live for your sake and never live for their sake. Uh, yes, go to our oath. Uh, there's a sense in which that is, but that wouldn't be a definition of freedom. That would be, uh, I would say, that would be the moral precondition kind of for really living freedom. That would be, you know, more basic than the political concept. I think freedom is a political concept. And that's why the freedom of fly is not even an issue, because that's, that's not a political issue. Freedom is a political concept. It's a concept that relates to our relationship at the end of the day with other people in the social context. If you're on a desert island, are you free? It doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. Yeah, so I would just like to um, challenge possibility, challenge metaphysical possibility there that, for example, with technological developments, it is true that, well, we can't define the laws of physics, but we can expand the things that are less physically available for us. I don't know, we can create our own freedom to live. I don't know, above absolutely. So absolutely we can do that up to a point, right? And in every era up to a point. So some, Leonardo da Vinci wanted to fly. So he tried to build machines, tried to do it, couldn't, didn't succeed. And he needed freedom in order to try. But he wouldn't say, I'm not free because I didn't succeed. So again, what, what would freedom mean then? Yeah. So uh, living your life without coercion of other people, without coercion against others. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, we're starting to, we live in a world with other people. Freedom means they can't force me to do what I don't want to do. That's a beginning, right? That's the beginning. So, freedom from other people coercion, freedom from force, freedom from authority. We understand that, for example, other people can take you and put you in jail. When you're in jail, are you free? No. Right? Even if you deserve to be in jail, you're not free. Why aren't you free? What are, what are, they, what are they limiting you, your capacity to do? So, put it now in a positive rather than negative. Because freedom is not a negative concept. It's a positive concept. It has, you know, a negative... Uh, negative, the, the, the non-corrosion is part of the definition, but it's not part of what it means, but it's not the essential. What's the essential? The ability to act. Yeah, the ability to act. Freedom is the ability to act in the world in pursuit of Values, your values. The values you have chosen based on what? Using what? Your mind. So, I want to fly. Okay, that's a value. Now I can use my mind to figure out how to do it. But it's not, I'm just going to flap my, my hands and jump off a cliff and fly. Right? It means using your mind in order to achieve something in order to pursue something. So, freedom is the freedom to act using your mind in pursuit of your values free or without coercion, force, authority on you. But I want to emphasize because I, you know, again, I don't think Freedom is just a negative, free of coercion. And then it's a concept that basically says, and you can do whatever the hell you want. 
That's not the positive version of freedom, at least as I see it, as I think we should all see it. Freedom is the ability to live your life. The ability to go out there and pursue values and achieve something and succeed in something, right? Free of, yes, free of all the coercion, force, and all that stuff. So when we talk about freedom, or when Rand talks about freedom, when we talk about freedom in the context of uh, you know, trying to have an impact on the world, the vision is a positive vision. And this is, uh, you know, this is the challenge because, as I said, a lot of people out there talk about freedom uh, and their visions are very different of what that means. If, uh, the, if you're a libertarian, the vision is just straight out negative. Right? It's lack of coaching. And then you should be able to do whatever you want. It, it doesn't have any, any moral uh, uh, content. It's just whatever. As long as there's no coercion, web. But for Rand, everything has moral content. Suddenly, everything political has moral content. So there's a purpose for freedom. The purpose is your life. The purpose is your values. The purpose is your mind. And there's a reason why no coercion. We'll get to that in a minute. Why you have, you have to add that no coercion. Alright, so that's our conception of freedom. Very different, I think, from the, what's out there in the world. Always important when you talk about freedom to define it so you know who you're talking to and you know what we're talking about. Like every concept, we need to be able to, if, if we don't, if we're not talking about the same thing, we're talking, you know, in pa parallel but not actually confronting the same kind of issues, the same kind of conflict. Why is freedom important? And, and here I think it's important to note that freedom is really rare. It's like human beings have been on the planet, I don't know, homo sapiens, anybody know? 100,000 years? Some form of humanoid, maybe much longer than that, but at least homo sapiens have been around for 100,000 years. Of the 100,000 years we've been on, planet, on this planet, and I'm not, I'm not assuming we're another planet before that. But, uh, you know, 100,000 years that we evolved into being homo sapiens. How many of those years have we been free, even a little bit, right? Not, not, with some coach. Not, not, but just not, where you, you, you know, you're completely constrained. Where you can act to some extent based on your own judgment and pursuit of your own values. How often does that happen? What's that? 250. 250 years. So the last 250 years is what makes life right now so special because I know how I know how easy it is to draw everything dark and make the world we live in right now seem awful and horrible and things are going terrible and the world is ending. And yet we right now are living at the best time ever to be human and alive, right? From many perspectives. Certainly from a material perspective. But we're free. We're relatively free. Uh, 250 years, maybe a little bit more. Maybe there were other periods, like not current Greece, but ancient Greece. Right? That period of Aristotle and Plato, at least part of that period, wasn't, uh, not all of it was, were, were people free. You know, period in the Roman Republic, maybe there was a few, maybe there was a decade or two in Venice where they were relatively free. You know, there have been pockets in hi human history where people have been free and never lasts. Never lasts. I mean, the, the amazing thing about the modern world is how long it's lasted, right? We've been basically free for about 200, 250 years in the West, in other places, it's been a lot shorter. I've just been, I was just in, you know, I've been in a lot of places, but I was just in Georgia. And, you know, Georgia's, like, been free since, like a lot of Eastern Europe, since 1991. It was never free before that, had Three years as a republic from 1918 to 1921 where they had relative freedom in Georgia, but then there was Soviet, before they were Russian Empire, then there was Soviet Union, and only when the Soviet Union crumbled. Are they, so for them, for example, in our world, freedom is, how, how long have the Chinese been free? Never. 
Vietnamese, never, right? Even the, the, the limited freedom that we complain about constantly in the West, much of humanity has never experienced. And that should cause you to think about it. This is not easy. There's something going on here that is really weird. Right? We love freedom. We love our freedom. We think we should have more of it. We fight for more freedom. And yet, it's, it's almost never existed. Well, the uh, agricultural revolution thing will be No, they won't. No, they won't. They're horribly oppressed by tribal leaders and witch doctors who, who told them all kinds of myths. We have no evidence and no reason to believe there were free people before that. That they could leave their tribe and go and switch to another tribe. They could emigrate or they could decide, I'm not going hunting today. I'm going to go to the beach today. No way were they free. Corrosion was everywhere in those kind of societies. And all you have to do is look at those societies that have survived in the Amazon jungle, in Africa, in New Guinea or whatever, and they're not free. Not free in the sense that they can use their own judgment and pursue their own values as individuals. There's no individualism in driving free agricultural societies. Individualism is a massive achievement. Freedom is a massive achievement. Very, very, very rare. So we have to understand why it's so rare if we're going to fight for it and why people reject it. Why don't people want freedom? And I would argue people don't want freedom. Because if they want freedom, it's relatively easy to get it. If there are enough of us, the challenge is that people don't want it. The people have never wanted it. I mean, uh, it, it's nice to think, as I think George Bush said in, I don't know, 2002, 2003, every human being has, uh, you know, freedom in their heart. They all want to be free. We just give them an opportunity and they'll jump on the bandwagon, I think. I think we learned in Iraq that maybe people don't always want to be free. But you don't need to look at Iraq, you need to look at human history, and you can see that. So why is freedom so hard? Why is freedom so difficult? Yeah? Some kind of satisfaction. So people are looking for safety. True, but you go back to the question of why. Why do they want to f why is safety? See, if I go to a country like that, if I live in a circumstances like that, I don't feel safe. I mean, it's not like um, it was safe in Middle Ages Europe. It's not like it's safe in North Korea. It's not like it's safe in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. That, that, that can be it. It might be a feeling of something, but I'm not sure safety is it because they're not safe in any of those environments. Yeah. They don't want to think. I think that's a big part of it. And then we have to ask the question of why don't they want to think? Um, I think so they benefit <clears throat> uh, from the perspective of the people that hold power. I kind of, you know, not think so. Uh, and from the perspective of the don't. For the one that hold power, you don't necessarily want too much freedom because if you've got a good thing, you might want to retain it. Yeah. And very regularly, you do kind of have some degree of power that just occurs that people will maintain it. So the people who don't have power don't want freedom because. So true. We we don't have many alternatives. Again, it's only modern times that we've had freedom. Uh, people who hold power want to keep it. There's no question about that, and they'll do anything to keep it. And it's pretty difficult to get rid of them, although it is possible, and we've seen lots of examples throughout history of getting rid of people with power. When the people who don't have power want freedom, they know they, they can rise up and get rid of them. It's just an, a matter of time and, and enough, enough people and enough passion and enough commitment. But it's fundamentally that people who don't have power through all human history, I don't think I've really wanted freedom. And part of it is that it's scary, risky. Uh, there are powers to be that are, that are you know, are, are oppressing you, that are limiting you, so it's dangerous to seek out freedom. And there's something about this idea of 
They don't want to think, right? And there's something really fundamental there. They don't want to take responsibility for their own actions. They don't want to take responsibility for their own actions. I would say even deeper than that. I think fundamentally, throughout human history, individuals didn't, didn't think they were empowered to and didn't want to take responsibility over their own life. They didn't want to take responsibility over their own life. Are you going to get me some more water? Uh, and I think that is... That's the key, right? If I don't want to take responsibility for my own life, if I'm worried about taking responsibility for my own actions, if I'm worried about taking responsibility for my own thinking, then I, and, and if, if doing, taking responsibility is going to cause me to be afraid, going back to the safety issue, then I don't want to be afraid. I want to be told what to do. Much more comfortable, much easier. Follow orders. It's no, you know, the risk is, I don't have to think about the risk. It's no risk, but it's a different type of risk. It's a risk that divorces me from that responsibility of thinking. But why do people want that? Why do people not want to take responsibility for their own lives? And I'd say there are basically two fundamental reasons for that. And they go to the heart and the core of Ayn Rand's philosophy. And they go to the heart and the core of why freedom is so rare and why I think we have an opportunity today to achieve freedom that past generations, past humans have, did not have. So, to advocate, to believe in freedom, to want to be free, one has to believe in two things. One, that you are capable of taking care of yourself, that you are capable of thinking and using your mind to achieve your values, right? That you're capable. And two, what would be the second one? Well, that's capable. So capable would include possible. But what's the second one? Wanting it, some, not exactly wanting it, because this is the reason why you'd want it or not want it. Just behind it. Yeah, that you're worthy of it. So one is that you're capable of it, and two is that you're worthy of it. Now, in philosophy, I don't, know, I don't know how much philosophy we covered today, but what is the first? In what area of philosophy is the first? Am I capable of it? What, what, what branch of philosophy would that cover? What's that? Aristotle. Well, Aristotle has an answer to that, but, but what branch of philosophy? That would be epistemology, right? Am I capable of thinking? Do, how do I know? What do I know? And the second one is moral, morality, right? Am I worthy of it? Should I be able to use my mind? Is that okay? And note that almost all philosophy says no and no. Our ideas, the ideas that we're taught by philosophers, are no and no. You're not capable of thinking. Reality, your reason, your, your rational mind is, is not connected to reality. You know, we go back to, I think, the most influential philosopher in all of human history. Who would that be? Plato. Plato is the most influential philosopher in all history. You don't see the world. You don't know what's real. The world of reality, of real reality, is in another dimension. It's somewhere else. Who, who communicate? who can uh, uh, access the other, this other world of, of perfection, of, of, of real reality? Who has access to it? Philosopher. Yeah, the philosopher. That's why we make him king. Right? He starts out as a philosopher. We make him king because he's the only one who has access to the real reality and we completely depend on him. If we're free to use our mind to achieve our values, what will happen to us? Well, right on our faces. We have no chance because, you know, to, to 
use Plato's uh, cave metaphor. We're just in the shadows. We don't see anything. We're just going to bump against, up against the wall because we, we're, we're basically blind. We need the guidance of this expert with the guidance of the philosopher, the guidance of the person who gets the, 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 the real knowledge to be able to achieve our values. So we are not competent enough to be free. And if you say that to people, and if you, uh, you, you know, and, and you look at philosophy, I mean, Kant says the same thing. Modern philosophy says the same thing. You don't know what reality is. Now, they vary about whether anybody does. You know, some modern philosophy just throws out the philosopher king together with you, so that we're all blind. We're all just wandering around. But at the end of the day, you are not competent to achieve your values. Your mind is not competent to guide you. You have to have a real theory that your mind is connected to reality, that your mind is actually, you're learning things from reality, from nature that you can then integrate that you can then reshape nature to achieve your goals. That's what it means to act in nature. And so much about intellectual world thinks that that is just you don't have that capacity. If you don't have that capacity, tell with freedom. I want somebody to tell me because I, I can't figure it out. I can't see. I can't know. So we don't have freedom to love extent because we don't have the confidence in our own mind that can actually guide us towards our value, to achieve our value. And I think this starts even before Plato. I think religion plays a big role here, right? What does religion teach us? Religion teaches us that, you know, it's just, there's an authority. And he tells you what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong. You don't know. That authority, you know, is God, Allah, whatever you want to call him, right? Jehovah. He is up there. And, and some people can communicate with him, the Pope, the prophets, and so on. And then they tell us what to do. It's the same kind of story as Plato's. But we don't know. Well, we just follow a book written thousands of years ago and we're supposed to follow it blindly. That's not freedom. Everything is there to undermine your capacity to use your mind in pursuit of your values. Forget about the fear of coercion. We haven't even got to that. So one, you have to believe, you have to have a theory, you have to have a philosophy that says your mind is capable. Your mind is capable of knowing reality. Your mind is capable of, of identifying values that are worth pursuing and then guiding you towards them. And what about worthiness? Are we worthy of freedom? Are we worthy of choosing our own values and pursuing our own values and living our own life? Again, much of philosophy and certainly religion tells us the answer is no. You know? You have original sin and you need to make up for it and your moral obligation is to whom? Who's your primary moral obligation to in life? Based on every other philosophy other than Aristotle the Nine Grand. Can't use those two. God, right? So you're just sacrificial being that is that's it. Whatever God wants. Is that freedom? No, you just do what God tells you. You're not worthy of using your own mind, pursuing your own values. You get to choose your values? Who the hell are you? Your whole point is you're supposed to serve. God is one alternative. Who else are you supposed to serve? What's that? Okay, we have to talk louder. Well, the king the saints, the tribe, the poor, the, the proletarian, the Aryan race, fill in the blank. You are nothing. You just are there to serve the other. So you're not worthy 
unless you deny yourself. And if you deny yourself, there is no freedom. You're there to serve. You're there to sacrifice. I mean, the whole morality that is conventional morality out there, explicit conventional morality, is a morality of altruism, otherism. And then we can fill in the blank on who the other is, but your purpose is to serve the other. And why is your purpose to serve the other? Because you're not worthy of serving yourself. That would be, what would that be if you served yourself? What do we call that? Selfish. Is that a good thing? Well, I mean, you're biased, but, you know, out there, outside of this room, is that a good thing? Does anybody in the world think that's a good thing? No. It's yeah. ugly, that's horrible, it's despicable behavior. So the reason we don't have freedom is not because people don't understand economics, or not because people don't understand politics. The reason we don't have freedom is because people don't think we're capable of it, and they don't think we're worthy of it. So the battle is not a political battle, it's not an economic battle. The real battle is epistemological. Yes, we can think for ourselves. Yes, we can take care of ourselves. Yes, not only can we take responsibility for our lives, but we can live that responsibility. We can execute on that responsibility. And second, I'm not your slave. I'm worthy of my own values. I can be worthy if I live up to them, right? I'm worthy of living for myself. And this is Rand's revolution, and this is why there's a sense in which Ayn Rand is the first philosopher to fully explain why freedom is a good thing, and why freedom is attainable, and why freedom is justifiable. Because who else out there in the history of philosophy has said, you have the tool to know reality, you have the tool to take full responsibility over your own life, and to live it, and to choose your values, and that tool is reason. And that you're worthy because your life is the standard. Your own life is the standard of value. The standard of morality. Who else has ever said that other than Rand? I mean, people hint at it. People kind of suggest it. It's in the air. In the Enlightenment. Right? They're, they're moving in that direction. Right? In the Declaration of Independence, they say you have a right to... Your own life, your own liberty, and pursuit of your own happiness. So they're, they're already getting a sense of that. And Thomas Jefferson, you know, bringing everything before reason is that quote with even the existence of God. So they, they're getting close, but Rand solidifies all that knowledge. She gives us a base from which now we can advocate for freedom. Because we can, we can take responsibility for our lives, and we're worthy of taking responsibility for our lives. Now, why the no coercion element? Why is that important? So, freedom is, you know, the, 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 the ability to act based on one's own rational judgment in pursuit of one's own rational values, free of coercion and force. Why is free of coercion and force? Why do we need that? What's that? You were pointing at somebody. I am losing my cue. Because you cannot act in the face of force. But it's even deeper than you cannot act. What else can't you do in the face of force? You cannot think. You cannot use your basic means of survival, which is your mind. You cannot use that that is necessary for you to survive, which is to think, you cannot do it in the face of force. So for Rand, the reason force is so evil is because force denies us the capacity to be rational, denies us the ability to think for ourselves. If I put a, you know, if I put a gun to your head, your thinking is irrelevant. Your ideas are irrelevant. Your values are irrelevant. You do what I tell you to do. Otherwise, life is over. There is nothing else. And coercion and force are that. You know, there's no accident that suddenly we got a lot of scientists, I don't know, in the 18th century, and there were very few scientists in the 
13th and 14th century. I mean, there were a few, but very few. Why was there an explosion of science in the 18th century and 19th century? Because the church wasn't burning people at the stake. Absolutely. In a sense, the gun was removed. Right? If the church is burning you at the stake for coming up with ideas, for discovering truths that go counter to the dogma, then maybe I'd rather not discover truths. Or maybe if I discover truths, I hide them. But once that gun is removed, and it was removed by by intellectuals, it was removed in the 18th century by enlightenment thinkers, by people saying, truth is what matters. It started to be removed a little bit before that. You know, Galileo, of course, already challenges the church, already the church doesn't feel empowered to burn him at the stake. That's a little bit extreme by that point. They just put him in house arrest. Human civilization is changing. And as we remove the gun, as we remove force, as we remove authority, what happens? More scientists, more philosophers, more people discovering truth, more entrepreneurs. What's that? More artists. Although artists, art kind of, I mean, that's a whole other issue, but art kind of, art in a sense, starts the whole process. Because it starts in art, right? The Renaissance is a, is a, Artistic revolution that then spreads to everything else. But, uh, but you, you just have more freedom to think, to explore, to challenge. And that's why we don't want coercion. We don't want coercion because it's the anti-mind. Because it's the thing that stops the human mind. And the human mind is how we, what makes us human. It's pretty, I, I'm surprised when I give these talks ask people what makes us human and people don't know it's like empathy is that what makes us human I mean it's uniquely to human beings empathy but there's a reason for that or cooperation that's what makes us human that's uh, what's his name's theory uh, the Israeli philosopher uh, Harari. Harari what makes us special cooperation really What's that? Ants cooperate, bees cooperate. Uh, what makes us human is our ability to think. Put it simply, ability to reason, ability to be rational, ability to, uh, uh, you know, abstract from the facts of reality, come up with abstractions, and then because of our ability to manipulate those abstractions and discover truth about the world, then go into the world and change it, and manipulate, and exploit it. Oh, that's Reason, thinking, our mind is what makes us human. And cooperation is a consequence of that. Even empathy is a consequence of that. Our mind allows us, our particular mind allows us to introspect, allows us to, to understand ourselves and to see other people. We can project onto them what we would feel in that situation. And, you know, and that, that's where empathy comes from. It doesn't come, it's not some automatic response that we have that is pre-programmed in us. It comes from our ability to think. It comes from our ability to reason and understand ourselves and try to understand other people as a consequence. But it's, it's fascinating to me that somebody as smart as Harari, somebody who's a philosopher, you know, can't, can't see that. And nobody wants, and, and it's interesting, almost nobody wants to say, no, what makes us human is our ability to think, and what we need to preserve is that ability to think. People get it, maybe, but no intellectual that I know of out there is really expressing it that way. Which is shocking, because it's the most basic of all ideas. It seems, once you get it, it seems really straightforward and simple. What else makes us human? Standing on two legs? That, that, that's not quite... Thumb, uh, thumbs? Have you heard the thumbs one? Thumbs are what makes us human. That's the difference between us and all other animals. What's that? Bipet. Better list by pit. If we buy pension stock, uh, for, if we buy pension stock, coercion, or violence, yes. and this is a stupid question maybe, but do you think that we might become weaker in a way? Yeah. You know, stupid questions. There's a lot of stupid answers, but there are almost no stupid questions. Uh, so if we stop coercion, we stop violence, and we become weaker. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't think so. 
No, I mean, why would we become weaker? It opens up more opportunities for us. Our strength doesn't come from fighting other human beings. Our strength ultimately comes from overcoming nature. It, our strength comes from reshaping our environment to fit our needs. And our strength at the end of the day is our you know, mental strength. It's our ability to think. And yes, you know, we evolved to have some physical strength as well because we, again, had to deal with nature. So, no, I, I don't think it weakens us in any way. It doesn't weaken us mentally because the challenges of how to live a good life still exist. They might be different, but they still exist. There is a theory today, I mean, both political and I'd say in kind of moral epistemological, there is a, a growing tendency in the modern world today to think we're too pampered for our own good. Life is too easy. So we've lost our ability to, to, to be sharp and to be focused. Uh, you, you know, teenagers, I don't know if you know, but there's a, there's a huge crisis right now, teenage depression, particularly girls. Big crisis, teenage depression. And some of it is, oh, they're pampered, they're, they're rich, it's, life's too easy. Another is, you know, my favorite thing, it, this is causing depression, massive depression. I mean, that's consensus right now. It's social media and iPhones. Before the phone, everybody's happy. Um, which is weird. Uh, but that's, so there are all these kind of theories. But no, I, I, I mean, it, it, I, to me, the answer is pretty obvious. People are depressed today because they like values. Okay, we have two nations. Two nations, yes. One of them has some sort of vibe, the other has some sort of vibe, and one of them is like... Yeah. 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 Eventually, after certain generations, this one have a more of an advantage? No, the other one would whip the other parties, you know, like that. Why? Because, I mean, you can see this a little bit in Ukraine, right? Why? What, what, what makes it possible to, to win? <laughs> uh, whether economically or military? How do you win militarily or economically? Think and invent weapons. What's that? Think and invent weapons. Yeah, you have to think to invent really sophisticated, cool weapons. That's or you have to think in order to start businesses that create wealth. So what happens to the country that has corrosion? It gets poorer and poorer and poorer. Or if it gets richer, let's say it has not that much cohesion, then it gets richer slowly. What happens to the country that is truly free? Where individuals are free to think for themselves, the entrepreneurs are free to invent new products, to build new things, hire new people, hire people, build, expand. What happens to this country? It gets richer and richer and richer and richer. And the richer it gets, not only can it invent new weapons and buy new weapons and build new weapons, but it's just much, much richer. And in this country is Nothing. I mean, this is why the Soviet Union lost, even though there's a lot more coercion in the Soviet Union. America was kind of pampered and rich and all of that, and it didn't even have to fight a war and the Soviet Union collapsed. Why? Because coercion leads to collapse. Coercion leads to death. Coercion leads to stagnation. Freedom leads to growth, success, prosperity, and power. You know, militarily, power comes ultimately from economic power. You're not going to become militarily powerful unless you have some wealth to be able to invest in and motivation. Guess who fights more? Guess who's a better fighter? Somebody who's fighting for their leader and their country and their God or somebody who's fighting for themselves and their, ha their, their family and, and the people they love and, and, and their own life. You can see again that a little bit of Ukraine right now, right? Ukrainians are much more motivated than the Russians because Ukrainians know what they're fighting for. What are they fighting for? Well, some sense of freedom, but they're fighting for their life, they're fighting for their property, they're fighting for their families, they don't want to be oppressed by a Putin. And what are the Russians fighting for? I don't think they even know. Some vision of a wonderful, Russian, you know, a mystical Russian empire that they have no clue how it benefits themselves. So they're unmotivated, Ukrainians are motivated because they're, they're homes. It's theirs. It's the difference between self-interested and a completely selfless motivation. Yeah. So, uh, you said them selfless motivation. Is that what you're coming into? Well, I'd say it's, it, I, you know, it's it's selfless 
deep down, yes, it's selfless. It's also mystical. I assume that it is just because they want to be good in politics. Who wants to be good in the, the little Russian soldier running around in the field there, who's just being pulled off the street and, and, and uh, put into a thing. I mean, maybe some of them believe it. I doubt most of them believe it. Um, many of them are doing it because they love Putin or they love Russia and, and they bought into the, the thing. But that's not, that's not self-interest. That's, you know, that's them sacrificing their interest for greater Russia. But greater Russia is not a value to them. It's not a, a rational value to them. It's not something that actually enhances their lives. So they're fighting for, you know how you always talk, I mean, Jordan Peterson, everybody says you have to look for a meaning in life somewhere out there. Something bigger than yourself. Now, I don't know anything bigger than me. For me, not for you, for you are nothing small. But for you, you are the standard of everything. Your, you know, the meaning that you're going to find is not out there. Because, for example, people say, people ask me, why fight for freedom? freedom? Isn't freedom something bigger than yourself? No. I know why I want to be free. Why do I want to be free? Because I want to use my mind in pursuit of my values to achieve my happiness. It's on me. Be me, me. Right? In kind of an irrational sense. It's about me. The freedom is subservient to my needs as a human being. My needs require freedom. Freedom is not above me. Freedom is in is part of me. It's a requirement for my survival. It's a requirement for my happiness. That's why I want to be free. So they pretend that there's something above them. But that's pretend. That's make believe. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you did a few mental health traction amongst it's primarily young people, but yes. Oh, well, that's wrong. It's primarily in America, at least. It's young people, and it's um, middle-aged white men. Uh, Working class. So, you mentioned that's due to, uh, yeah, like a lack of value. Yeah. Uh, so, you might, you might expect them to be general. Yes. Uh, um, but, so, why is it kind of... Just about that. Like, why do you think there are uh, those lack of values? How would you propose for having that? Sure. Um, and lastly, uh, do you think that links to what you were saying about <coughs> easy life? Do you think there is a I mean, there is a connection. It's a dangerous connection, but there, there is some connection. Um, when you're trying to survive, when you're literally trying to survive, it, there's a sense in which you don't have time to be depressed. You're busy surviving. You're busy working hard. You know, you, you, I don't think you're happy, but you're not depressed because you're just active. You're just trying to... When you're removed somewhat from the life of death kind of context, and you're comfortable and everything, now you have time to think. And you have time to... to, to, to and you have time to read and study. And what are you learning? That man is incompetent, that reason is futile, then your life belongs to the tribe and the group and the race and the fill in the blank, right? Something other. That's depressing. That's objectively depressing, right? If I believed that, I would be super depressed. And that's the sense in which what you have to have people develop is a, a confidence in their own mind, a confidence in their own ability, Call it self-esteem, right? This, this sense that I am competent, I'm able. And then a worthiness. Again, this is also a component of self-esteem. I am worthy to be on this earth. I am worthy to achieve these achievements. I am worthy of this. So it's not about sacrificing to them. It's about living my life based on my thought, you know, values in pursuit of my happiness. And that's okay. That's good, not just okay. And if, if, if people accept that, then I think happiness is relatively easy. Because now it's just a matter of, okay, within the scope of all the values available, all the things available in the world, what are the ones I'm most excited about? Right? But I've already answered the question of, I'm worthy of happiness, and this is the means to which right, I have to use my mind to pursue values. Just now I have to fill in which values it is. So, 
uh, you know, people being depressed is a consequence of, again, unworthy and incompetent. And, and I, I don't think that there's an accident that's rising. It, it, it's rising with, you know, uh, I think they say since 2011 or 2012, depression rates among young people have gone up dramatically. And, and you know, that's also the time where kind of a, a, the beginning of political kind of wokeness came in and, and uh, identity politics and identifying yourself with a particular race or sexuality or whatever and you know that's a new tribe and a new undermining of the individual and all these things I think are, are connected and now what, what am I doing with my life how do I do it well how do I think about this how do I act it just confuses everything um, and I think it, it gets worse as the philosophy and the culture is worse yeah yeah right, okay. I, I often hear this question that you told me to ask you Oh. <laughs> did he also answer it or did he just say uh, well, he, he gave us a few suggestions but okay so but he um, wouldn't commit I, to anyone of, oh. Right. Ah, so I find it like very difficult to have any meaningful conversations with people who either subject themselves to make beliefs and it's like people are more like a lot of people are more disposed to are more disposed to not thinking and not taking responsibility rather than thinking about what is possible and what they deserve. Mm -hmm. So, like, how do you actually talk to these people? Because, like, these ideas are just very attractive that you don't even think that's a very attractive idea. How do you talk about it? Well, I mean, the key point you have to make to them is that they're not attractive. Like, imagine, I mean, you seem like a thinking person. Imagine not thinking. Like, it's that, like, horror passes through my, you know, it's, it's terrific, that, that idea. I think you have to appeal to whatever is good in them, if there still is. If there's no good in them, forget. Just walk away. There's just no point. Don't waste your time. But if, if there is good, they, 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 they're smart, they, they are motivated a little bit, they want to be happy, they're just confused, they don't know. You have to appeal to the positive. And you have to project to them what is possible. Uh, so, so, you know, don't, don't just lash out at them, obviously. Uh, you got to, you know, depending on why they have a particular point of view of it, you have to spin it around and find a way to motivate them if they've got some positive value out there, to motivate them to really examine what's going on, right? If, if somebody says, yeah, I don't, I don't want to think, it's easy not to think it. You know, give them a few scenarios where that, even they would get that that's not a good idea. So you just want to be a slave, you just want to be told what to that, that's, is that really, and they go, no, well, no, it's, okay, so you want to think sometimes, you want to, with, with, the, with the boundary, why, and try to get to why they have this attitude. Um, Ultimately, I think even that they don't know it, and many of them can articulate it, it's going to boil down to the fact that they don't believe that it makes a difference. And then you have to show them it does. It does in human history, and it does in individual history. To think or not to th I mean, to be or not to be, Hamlet's statement, which is the key question in all of life, right? that's it. It's all, it's all to be or not to be, is really to think or not to think. And uh, if you can explain that to people and you can show them that, then maybe we've got a chance. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned earlier that a person, an individual who gets a set of rules from, let's say, a god, that would be done with a new game, and maybe even uh, gets his morality from, that, from the same god, isn't free. But... If that's so, then freedom is in political context, um, and then it would apply even to an individual in the other. So no, I didn't say he wasn't free. I said he doesn't value free. Okay. He doesn't value free. Why? Because he, he doesn't want to trust his own mind because he's, 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 getting, he's getting commandments, he's getting authorities. And, and yes, we might limit it to morality. Oh, it's just about the Ten Commandments. But it's always going to expand beyond that because I've already accepted that I, I can't think for myself in this realm, and then it, it, it spreads into the political realm. So the more you take religion seriously, the less likely you are to be an advocate of freedom, and to want freedom. 
So you can still be religious and advocate for freedom. But that means you're not taking religion too seriously. It's like the Langman thinkers. The Langman thinkers didn't take religion too seriously. So they could be advocates of freedom. And the, and, but the more religious, the more they took their religion seriously, the less freedom politically you could allow. So uh, freedom is a political issue. So the only way you, you're not free is somebody constrains you. Like your attitude towards freedom. That is, that, that, that depends, right? Whether you want freedom or not. Yeah. Does uh, life for men today in the 21st century require an addition to freedom from force, require some form of professional education? And therefore, should an education voucher be also an individual right in addition to freedom from force? No, I don't, I don't think, I don't think uh, education is a requirement of human survival. You know, what education? I mean, that's the next question, right? You can't say education because which education? Whose education? At what age? You know, high school educated to survive? I mean, I, you could argue that high school education today is a detriment to survive. It's one of the reasons everybody's depressed because of the kind of education that's in high school. So even if you wanted to make that case, you couldn't make it as education. You'd have to make it as a specific type of education, a specific quality of education. And, and that, can't be, that can't be a right. It can't be a right because um, it has to be produced. And therefore, somebody has to produce it. You can't have a right to somebody else's products. You can't have a right to somebody else's uh, uh, you know, uh, effort and time. Yeah, so you have to pay for it, right? So people produce stuff all the time. And, and, and you have to pay for the military. If you don't pay for it, it, it doesn't exist. But, uh, but again, there is a fundamental, you know, human life requires thinking. So, so if you, you know, so the enemy of thinking, the thing that rejects thinking, is what we need protection from. Everything else, there's a marketplace. I mean, I could say, you say you have a right to education. I mean, much more important than education is food. Can't live as man without food. So, should that be, should the government give us vouchers to buy food? Can't live without it. No, not necessarily. But if nobody will, I mean, with food you can get an education, right? You need food before you can get educated. Try studying on an empty stomach. It's hard. No, I mean, rights are freedoms of action. That's it. They're not stuff. You don't get the military. Right does not, a right doesn't uh, provide you with military. It provides you with the absence of a force. Okay, now, what does absence of force require? It requires a police and a military. It doesn't require education. It doesn't require food. It doesn't require all of these other things. The thing that you're trying to eradicate from society is not threats to survive. It's not what you're trying to eradicate from society. You're trying to eradicate something very, very specific. And that is force, coercion. And for that, you need a military and police. That's why they're legitimate functions of government and nothing else. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're talking, um, so you did redefine freedom as, uh, in part, you freedom from coercion uh, and as well freedom to pursue our values, etc. Yeah, freedom from coercion is part of it because, it, but, but the reason you want to be free of coercion is in order to. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you, how, how would you know? So, um, we're necessarily born in unequal circumstances. Uh, what do you make of the idea that we might have a responsibility to um, allow people to best pursue their values? For example, it could be through, like, even in a sense, like what you're doing to try and educate people into opening their eyes towards yeah. their recruiting level. Um, yeah, how, how would you kind of square that? Uh, let me now. So, so, um... I don't think you have an obligation per se to other people. You have an obligation to other people to the extent that it 
corresponds to your interests, to, to, to your life. Uh, generally, you benefit from having other people who are educated and who are, uh, you know, again, free themselves and who can trade with you and who can produce and create. So you as an individual have a self-interest in establishing freedom, in, you know, and, and in some cases even, in helping other people directly, whether through charity or through direct investment, in other people in order to help them, uh, you know, pursue their values. Uh, the reason we want freedom is, is because we want to live in a better society, a society where, you know, as individuals we can live a better life. So it always boils down to that. It always boils down to, to your own ability to pursue values. freedom of speech because it's a very uh, I get into dilemma with this topic because to what extent are you free? Because you you can say whatever you want, yep. but you end up hurting someone uh, or politically or personally. So is there real sense of freedom in that, or do we are we uh, we we can even get cancelled by the culture and the society as well? So. Where do we draw the line? To what extent is okay? What are your thoughts on that? So, you know, it, it is it is a tricky issue, particularly today, because it, it's such it's so much in the headlines and everything. Um, how does freedom relate to speech? Right. So, freedom is uh, our ability to uh, to act uh, in pursuit of our values, in, uh, in pursuit of, uh, using our minds in pursuit of our values free of coercion, right? That applies to speech, right? Speech is an act. We, we talk, right? We, we write, we produce. And what is not allowed is for somebody to come and, and, and use foresight, right? And that's true generally. Speech is just a particular type of instant of it because we know that historically, government has used force in these devious ways of, of stopping you from writing certain things and stopping you from, from saying certain things. But in a sense, free speech is no different than any other free. Nobody, ha nobody can coerce you in a way that stops you or limits your ability, again, to pursue your life based on your values and your standards. Uh, so I don't think it's any different. But remember, what is coercion? And this is where it gets tricky, right? What is coercion? Coercion is, is physical force. It's or threat of physical force. So if you hurt somebody else's feelings, is that, was any physical force used? I mean, assuming it's just speech. Right? No. So no, nobody's violating anything. If you're, I mean, you might not want to hurt other people's feelings for lots of reasons. Right? There's no reason to hurt people's feelings for no reason, right? Sometimes there is. But, but uh, you know, but... So, but it's not physical force. So, uh, unless somebody literally comes and physically assaults you, or physically threatens you, then you're not violating their rights. You're not violating their free speech rights. Uh, so, uh, so that is, that's one example. But then people say... Um, but you know, if Twitter doesn't carry my speech, then it's basically using force because it's, it's, it's rejecting me from the platform, right? So it's using force to reject. Yeah, but, uh, you know, if you come to onto my, if, if, if we're running a business and you violate the contract between us, I'll fire you. Is that force? No, it's a violation of a contract. So it's my property and we have a, uh, an agreement, or if you come... If you, um, if you come into an office and, and, and just don't belong it, I can kick you off. Because again, there's an implicit contract associated with coming onto somebody else's property. So again, there's nothing, in a sense, there's nothing special about free speech. It's just a, one of many applications of freedom. It's, it's like there's only one right. We only have one right. When it comes to individual rights, there's only one right. That's the right to your life. And how is that right violated? With through coercion, physical force, and threats. Can't be violated by me saying, I don't like you anymore. 
It can't be violated by me insulting you. It can't be violating by me protecting my private property or by uh, me changing, you know, in a voluntary relationship, not wanting to deal with you anymore, firing you as an employee or just walking away from a relationship. So you always have to think about what is it that's happening that is literally a violation. And Twitter kicking me up, Twitter, you know, we, we have a contractual relationship, hasn't worked out for whatever reason, we part our ways. No rights are being violated. You know, and if they violated the contract, right, if they did something that they said they wouldn't do contractually, then I, you know, there's, I can sue them, the courts of law, there's, there's a way to deal with those kind of things. But there's no, there's no uh, right violation in just the fact that they don't want to deal with me anymore. There are lots of people I don't want to deal with and don't. They can't say, oh, Iran has to deal with me. I demand that Iran deals with me because I want it. Because that, that's a limitation of my freedom because I don't get what I want. That's the whole point in the beginning where your wants are not what defines your freedom. Yeah. Uh, so this idea of freedom without uh, coercion definitely sounds good intuitively. But is there a way that we can uh, prove that using first principles or some kind of uh, theory or something like that? Or do you think that that's even I think when it comes to human relationships, always uh, be wary about proving from first principles. Human knowledge doesn't come from first principles. Human knowledge comes from, primarily, comes from, uh, you know, from rational thinking about the situation, which is not just deriving some truth from and A is A from, from some first. It's about inductively understanding the world around you, human relationships. So can it be proven logically is the question. And the answer is yes, absolutely. And, and I think that the outline, yes, I mean, Rand, Rand has written about this and I think proves it logically. But logic isn't formal logic, right? Logic is about actually understanding the connection of these ideas to reality and what, in this case, what human existence requires, and you learn, how do you know what human existence requires? Do you know that from first principles? It makes a fact that you have to take into account that reality is what it is, that A is A, that there's a law of identity, those are kind of first principles you could argue, right? Axioms. Uh, but beyond that, how do you know what human beings require? Well, you look, you, you observe, you induce some human experience, from human history, from human, uh, you know, from people around you, what they're doing, and from everything you know about history. And you can see some behaviors, destructive, horrible, oh, okay, I can generalize those behaviors into the irrational, or the use of force, or depending on how you, you, you do the, uh, the, the ultimate induction. But, but everything we know, we know ultimately from observation, and then understanding, generalizing, abstracting, and seeing the relationship and making sure there are no contradictions. No. I, I, I think the problem is that people try to use kind of formal logic to convince, and that's very unconvincing. I always find formal logic to be some, uh, always, e even when I was young, to give me the sense of they're pulling a trick on me. There's something here that's just not right that I'm not seeing. Because it is. I mean, I, I, I don't, I can't pull up examples of this, but you can take, you know, deductive logic and you can come to any conclusions you want if you have the right stupid premises. Yeah, but you don't, the point is that logic encompasses more than just deductive proofs. And induction is hard, but you can't, you know, Newton didn't derive his, 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 his laws just from the from first principles. There has to be, there has to be, indu you know, induction plays a massive role in what scientists do. But we don't, induction is harder to put into, um, what, it, what do you call it, uh, formal structures. And that's why we feel a little uncomfortable with it. But we have to, and scientists do it all the time. They use they use that all the time. Yeah. Uh, 
this one across and given the I would argue that they haven't been sustainable. Now, it's true, the further back you go, the longer they last, but that's because there's less competition, there's less ideas, there's less communication, there's less knowledge, people are more ignorant, it's easier to oppress them. The, 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 the more people know, uh, the shorter the life of, of oppressive societies uh, becomes, unfree society becomes. I don't think you can count Christianity because uh, it's not one society, but if you look inside of Christianity, right, constant warfare, constant battles, constant changes, constant up, upheavals, it's a very unstable system. The problem is that the alternatives are just other systems of coercion. The alternative is, is almost never freedom because of the ideas we talked about, the ideas that dominate the culture ideas that are anti-freedom. So then what you get is just constant battles between different ideas of anti-freedom and there's no free alternative out there. Uh, why do the systems of freedom last so little, so short, such short periods of time? Because they have no intellectual foundations. So take Venice. Venice for a little while was free. Almost accidentally they set up a system of governance that basically allowed people a lot of freedom. But there was no intellectual foundation for that. They didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't, uh, you know, think about it. They didn't structure it in the right way. And at some point, all it takes is a little crisis, a little challenge, and they revert back to the system that that is just... Uh, and, and it doesn't happen all at once. So freedom in Venice, so, you know, slowly deteriorates, it slowly becomes more authoritarian, and there's no real pushback because it's slow and because, again, there's no intellectual movement to advocate for freedom because there's no understanding of freedom. The only time in all of human history where there was an intellectual movement dedicated to freedom, there wasn't one in Greece, there wasn't one in Rome, the first time in human history where there was an intellectual movement dedicated to this was the Enlightenment. So everything before the Enlightenment was just, we kind of, get freedom for a variety of reasons, but then we don't quite know what to do with them. We don't know how to defend it. We don't know why it's good, really. And it, it, it's easily collapsible. But once the enlightenment is there, now we have some momentum. And that's lasted 250 years. It won't last forever because the enlightenment is being attacked and is constantly being attacked and is oh, constantly being challenged. And most people today don't even know what the enlightenment was and what the ideas were and what it taught us. Um, and... It's slowly eroding and ultimately we'll lose our freedoms because of that erosion unless we revitalize those ideas. So my go I, I, I view a big part of our mission as saving the enlightenment because that's what it means to save freedom. It means save those ideas. Um, but those ideas are constantly uh, uh, under attack. But, but look, it, it, enlightenment is, has had a profound impact on human beings already. So if you look, if, if you go anywhere in the world today, or, or let's put it this way, 300 years ago, if I'd gone anywhere in the world and said, who does your life belong to? Who's, whose life is, you, is your life? Well, your life implies something, but, but your life, who does it belong to? Almost everybody would say God, the king, the tribe, state, the whatever, right? Some, some other being. Today, you can go almost anywhere, China, I, my guess is Vietnam, uh, you know, parts of Africa, all of Europe, even Russia. And you ask people, who does your life belong to? And they say, me. That seemed like, that didn't exist in the past. Nobody thought in those terms. My, my life is mine. It wasn't a concept. Either. So that's new. And, and that's the heritage of the Enlightenment. We need to build on that. There's a lot of work to build on that. But 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 the fun, some of the foundation is, is is there. How are we doing in time? All right, a couple more questions. Yeah. So it's a society that is free, where people are um, free to act based on their own values. Um, what do you think about that? Um, what do you think about that? 
Because while our values might differ, the one thing we're not allowed to do is impose our values on each other. We each live our own values. And, and you know, so that, you know, that creates, for example, a society with division of labor because we each like doing different things. And then we trade. So actually, see, in a society where values are imposed from the top, disagreement about values always leads to clashes. A society where you can live your life any way you see fit, and then, you know, reality is the only judge of whether it's good or not, as long as you don't impose your will on other people, then you either succeed or you fail based on the values that you chose and based on how you pursue them, whether you use, you know, reason or not. But there's no, there are no real clashes because that's the one thing that's banned is the use of physical force. Like, that, um, and the way, like, you can't act, like, physically, uh, act on, on... Yes, freedom implies, freedom implies the, 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 the freedom to act uh, in pursuit of your own values, free of coercion and force and, and authority that imposes its values on you. And ultimately... I mean, Rand, Ayn Rand writes about this, that between rational people, there are no real conflicts. There might be what look like conflicts, but there are no real conflicts. So two people go off for a job, and only one can get it. But if they both understand that, that uh, the, the certain qualifications, we live in a system in which the owner gets to decide, who gets the job, I don't get to decide, that's what freedom means, and uh, this other guy might be more qualified than me, then that's not a conflict. It's, you know, we can't both get one job, but it, 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 it's not, you know, you don't resent the guy for getting the job, you don't resent the employer for, because that's, you understand the process, you understand what goes into it, you understand somebody else might be more qualified than you, for whatever reason. Yeah? Does the an intellectual firepower required to understand objectivism greater than the ability to understand Christianity or, or other religions. And, and I know you really like, you know, potentially, you know, it's all about education and the future and it's going to lead to this 20 years, but what if it just stays in academia because it's so hard to understand or, I don't know, the, the layman or something. Um, yeah. Is that a risk? I don't think so because I don't think people need to understand objectivism in order to live it, fully understand it. And indeed, most people don't, are not theologians of Christianity, right? But imagine a world in which people, uh, you know, so where the intellectuals, the public intellectuals are constantly talking about reason and rationality and living your life based on your values and interpreting the world in that way. And people just absorb into the, and to some extent this is what happened in America in the 19th century, they absorbed into their psyche that they should live for themselves and take personal responsibility and pursue their happiness. And, and they don't understand it. They, they've never studied the meta-ethics. And they don't understand the complete validation of reason. But you know, when they use reason, it actually works for them. And when they go by their emotions, they actually flop. And, and this is how the intellectuals explain it to them. Right, right now, you use your reason, you succeed, you use your emotions, you flop, and the intellectuals tell you, oh, no, 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 you don't understand exactly the other way around, right? And that just creates confusion in people. But imagine the intellectuals reinforce what actually happens to people. They don't have to understand the whole philosophy, and they will understand it to different levels. So, but this is why you have to have the intellectual high ground. Because, because you have to have the people at the universities and the people commenting on the news and the people writing the op-eds in the paper and the people uh, teaching, it, you know, you have to have them with a deep understanding so that they can then apply it in a variety of ways so that people can absorb it at whatever level they can absorb it. So when it comes to freedom of speech uh, in particular, if say you are giving a lecture and somebody stands up and starts giving their lecture at the same time you are giving your lecture. Yeah. Wouldn't this make it just impossible for any for anyone either one of you to get anything across? In other words, is there a point in creating a society with free people where it just gets so complicated that we should sort of strive for a for a less free but more reasonably achievable yeah. objective. But no, because one of the parties there is using force. 
one of the parties infringing on the freedom of the other party. So I paid for a lecture hall, or I've been invited to give a talk, and somebody's paid, and there's an implicit contract. When you walk in through that door, coming to an uh, you know, uh, Ayn Rand uh, UK event, there's an implicit contract, and, and you know, we could make it explicit, right? That you're, you're going to let the people speak, and you're on somebody else's property, and they get to set the rules, and if you do stand up and disturb, then you will be guided out nicely. So, so freedom of speech doesn't mean, again, going back to what freedom means. Freedom doesn't mean doing whatever you want to do. It's, freedom means, again, these actions, free of coercion. You can't coerce other people. By standing up and not letting me speak, you're coercing. You can walk out, you can do a lot of things, but you can't stop me from speaking. And creating noise is the way we know there's such a thing as noise pollution. And, you know, you're not allowed to play a stereo super high in the middle of the night. And there are lots of ways in which sound can infringe on my rights. This is one of them. All right. Thanks. You want a last question? Okay. I would like your thoughts on preferred pronouns, please. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I, for the most part... I tend to use the pronoun the person wants to wants me to use. I, I'm not in the business of checking out the genitalia and figuring out who they are and what they are. That's their business. What if it's a word like seer? No, I don't. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I, th that's that's ridiculous. But again, I can imagine a context in which was it was I was watching uh, Billions. Have you ever seen Billions? Billions is the first time I ever saw. Uh, Billions is a, a show on, I think, Showtime. Um, it, it's the first time I ever saw, saw and it, it bothered my, because I couldn't, I couldn't understand what was going on in the show for a while until I figured out that this one character was trans and, and it is required, they, they were they or something like that. Um, and and I, it's like, it took me like, I think all season just to figure out what the hell was going on because it was so out of, now it's like everybody, it's, 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 it's in the consciousness. This is how art proceeds what happens in the culture. No, I, I think there are limitations, but you know, I, 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 I know, I know a, a, an economist who, is, who I became friendly with, and she was, a, you know, she started as a male, and now she's a female, and I think she's had the surgery and everything, and she dresses like a female, she looks like a female, everything about it, and she wants to be, you know, uh, treated as a female, and I, I'll call her she, absolutely. I was living in San Francisco until a couple of weeks ago, and so I knew a lot of cross-dressers and yeah. trans women. Yeah. For some reason, I don't have an issue with calling for men who want to be women yeah. she, yeah. but like Zir and Zim and even they. Yeah. For um, They is offensive because they is, is instead of, you know, it, it's not singular. They is, which is really I, weird. Um, so I don't know even what that means. So I agree with you. I, I would feel really weird about doing that. I haven't really thought it through about, you know, the whole thing. But yes, I mean, if, if, if you want to be called, if you want to be treated as a man or, or call, you refer to as a man or refer to as a woman, I'm not in the business of, 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 of evaluating in, a, in our personal, you know, exchange. Any other kind of pronoun? Yeah, I, I, I've never used. I wouldn't know what to do with it. If somebody asked me to use it, I would like, uh, I, it would seem too strange for me. But, um, and this idea that by using a Z, really what they're trying to do is negate gender. To, to negate that there is such a thing as a gender. I mean, it's one thing to have a she and he, but the whole idea is there is no such thing as she and he. We're all somewhere in the middle. I, I don't buy that. Thank you all.